Hello all. Yes, peak fuel salt works in the rims of Galloway. Um, we're moving away from all these big coal fuel works we're looking at to much smaller, much smaller <laughs> rural affairs. First question is, I suppose, where are the rims of Galloway? Well, they're way down in the southwest, and about as far away as you can get on mainland Scotland from Brewer. You'll see from that that the, the rims form this hammerhead peninsula, the Irish Sea to one side, and over to the east, the Solway Firth. The Solway Firth has a long history of, Solway, of uh, salt production. Earlier this morning, Richard was talking about some of the medieval salt works, and there were these uh, bleaching sites all along the, the Cooperty coast, as far as Annan in the far, far east. Um, during the early post-medieval period, bleaching actually continued. There were these sand-washing sites in the Annan area, which worked through right until the 1820s, the latest bleaching sites, certainly in Scotland, some of the latest in the UK. But the sites we want to look at are some of these post-medieval direct boiling salt works. Nick will talk later about some of the ones in the centre of the Solway, and I'll be looking at these ones right over here in the Zinn. Now, for somewhere which really is in the middle of nowhere, there were an incredible number of salt works in the 17th and 18th century. All of them, however, were very, very small affairs, and presumably all serving a local, very local market. I want to look at the the archaeology, the archaeological survival of six of those sites. The first two, the archaeology is pretty ephemeral, but bear with me, it gets better as we go along. So the first one is the only site on the, the east coast of the Rim, Chapel Rotham. Now, we know very little about most of these sites. There's been very little history done. Uh, interestingly here, there's this reference in 1680, the Reverend Andrew Simpson, his wonderful large description of Galloway, talks about the dual of Logan's salt town here. And he says, good salt is made with peat instead of coal. <laughs> so it's interesting that even here in the 1680s, uh, local observers are intrigued by this use of peat instead of coal. The reason is obvious. There is no coal anywhere near. You're looking at either Cumberland, the far end of the solar turf, or going up the outer coast. If you want to make peat, uh, you want to make salt, and you're into Galloway, you've got to use peat. The only reference you have to the location is John Ainsley's 1718 map. So you can see there salt pans highlighted, and they seem to correspond to this area now by a couple of cottages on a low raised beach. Now, about 20 years ago, Dave Cranston did a remarkable survey of all the salt works either side of the solar, both on the Scottish and on the English side. And he had a good walk around at Chapel Ross and was able to find no evidence at all of any archaeological survival. I followed literally his footsteps on the foreshore, and again, I think anything that might have been here has long since been destroyed by these later buildings. The same is true following this next site, Salt Pans Bay at Ardwell. Again, shown on John Ainsley's map of 1782, the salt pans. Um, the Ordnance Survey records talk about two salt pans here, derelict in the 1840s. Again, this cottage we can see seems to have been built on the site of the salt pan, but there is this rather intriguing channel running from the foreshore towards the modern cottage, which I'd like to think is possibly a watercourse from the foreshore to the salt pan. Logan, who had the Chapel Rotten salt pan, also had what we call the Logan salt pan here at Port Gill, also on the, the west coast, west facing Irish coast. Again, we know it was in operation by the 1680s, with this record of um, leasing the set for James Mitchell with, quote, liberty to cast 3,000 loads of peat yearly. All the accounts we see seem to have peat cutting as an essential part of the leaf. And this suggests that probably what we're looking at is a combination of salt making and peat cutting in combination. 
We could also suggest that probably we're looking at a seasonal operation. Now you can see on this aerial photograph, there are some uh, enclosures here, and a small building here. When we look at the Roy map of the 1750s, you can, with the eye of faith, whoops, you can, with the eye of faith, see some buildings here which might correspond. Um, when you look at this building now, it's been later used as a farm set. I wonder if it could be a dwelling house for the property, or maybe even one of these journals or storehouses. It survives quite well, albeit much altered, but keeps the potential there for archaeology and further recording. As for the salt works themselves, the salt pans. There are a number of intriguing foundations either side of the bay, um, which certainly would repay further investigation. Whether these are part of the salt works, whether they're earlier or later structures, there's no way at the moment of really knowing. And interestingly, on Canmore, the only reference to the site is this building here, this reused railway wagon. They haven't actually mentioned the salt works. When we get to the next site, Galdenoch, we actually start getting some, some real archaeology. This is the largest of the, the Galloway salt works, of the Rin salt works, and also the longest lived. Certainly in operation by the, the early 17th century and seems to continue right through until the 1820s. Um, through all that time, it was owned by the, the Agnews of Galdenoch, later the Agnews of Loch Nor. And here, as you can see in the 1640s, in the 1640s, they're leasing the salt pan and works, and also, as we saw again, liberty to cut peats for the salt pan. So again, we're seeing this combination of leasing the salt works and the fuel at the same time. And on the, the Roy map, here are the salt pans, and this area here is the, the Galdenoch peat beds. And actually, Agnew's uh, tower house still survives very well preserved here. On the site itself, it's quite a complex site. Um, the things shown here in sort of a rather unpleasant flesh colour are actually an Iron Age hill fort, which dominates the headland of Saltpans Bay. Around here we've got quite a nice little farmstead with a nice rectangular farmstead building in it. And here are the salt pans themselves. The chances are that this building here was actually built as part of the original lease of the salt works. Um, in the 1740s, there's this reference to two dwellings at the salt pans, valued at two pounds sterling. So I wonder if what we've got, in this fairly isolated part of the Rins coast, you've not just got a salt works, but you've got a combined salt works and farmstead. It's really a small subsistence setup. And so, as well as cutting the peat, making the salt, the salter and his family, if that's where they were, are also working these small fields around and about it. So, a fairly self sufficient setup. Of the, the actual salt work buildings, we seem to have quite a well preserved pan house here. Now, just a long rectangular earthwork, but a suggestion of hidden stonework there good archaeological potential. Running down the bank here, a lot of um, processed residue, sort of small slaggy-like stuff, presumably from scraping the pans. And down on the foreshore, what may be a bucket pot. I'm worried that all the bucket pots we're seeing in the Solway seem very, very tiny to what we're seeing further north. Are we just, interpreti just interpreting natural hollows as bucket pots? I don't know. But it's interesting, in the 1740s, that same lease, it talks about the pan house, uh, the peat house, and a larger hole digged in the ground, which must be a bucket pot, if not this bucket pot. And where is the peat house? Presumably this would have been a fairly large structure, not just at this site, but at the other ones. But so far, we've not identified any particular peat house building. A bit further coast again, a very tiny but very well preserved site. They always have the same name, Saltpan Bay, Saltpan Bay, Aries. Here, 
This is what we think is probably the pan house. This little sketch survey here, probably a forehouse here, and the pan chamber here. And just down here on the foreshore, we've got a possible bucket pot. Again, if you look at the scale there, that's only a metre. Do we buy it as a bucket pot? If not, where was the bucket pot if there was one? But I think more interesting at this particular site, we've got this very, very large heap of process waste. Sadly being eroded by winter storms, uh, there's maybe about a 20 centimetre high section there. When you look at it, a nice combination of sort of burnt clay at the bottom, burnt stone here, and a lot of presumably mainly fuel waste from peat. But again, I think given the rare survival now of these peat-fueled works, doing some sampling there could actually be, some, could be quite interesting. And just to give you some idea there of the layout of this little tiny works, pan house, bucket pot, a couple of tiny buildings here, too small for the peat houses probably, and this large process dump here and a smaller dump here. So again, very, very tiny compared to what we're seeing in the Firth of Forth and further north, but I think probably quite a, a complete little setup surviving there on the Rins coast. All these sites we've looked at so far are, I believe, ones where there's some documentary evidence in terms of the, the tax receipts and so on. But there's one site we came across recently which seems to have escaped notice. This is looking again at Saltpans Bay in Galdenoch. The known site is just down here. When you cross south down the bay, hidden below the cliffs here is a place called Durham Wisley. And this was first um, recorded by the Royal Commission back in the 1980s as a probable farmstead. But it's a funny place for a farmhouse and a farmstead. You are, as you can see, right on the cliff edge here. It's exposed to all the winter storms. I think trying to operate a farmstead there would be very, very problematic. When you look at the building, the main one here is, as you can see in the sketch plan, divided into two compartments. A long low one here, the second compartment is quite raised up and you can see what seem to be probably furnace flues running underneath it. And it looks for all the world like a small little but very well preserved pan house. You can imagine some sort of crane or winch on the side here dropping down four meters to what is pretty much a permanent pool of salt water there. Just bringing it up into the pan house and firing it. I don't buy it as a farmstead. I think you can only really interpret it as a little tiny salt works. <coughs> Nearby is this rectangular building. Is this a possible peat store? I think it's too small. I still think at this point we don't know where the peat was being stored, but we're seeing on these little sites, these other ancillary buildings, some sort of store, possibly a little temporary bothy, whatever it might be. The interesting thing here is, of course, this site, if it is a salt works, has no documentary evidence for it. What was it? What was it doing here? Given the fact that it's so close to Salt Pans Bay and the known salt works, was this actually like an, an illicit salt works? Were you producing salt here on the sly? Does it tie in with this, the Irish Sea smuggling trade, just the production of surplus illicit salt? I don't know. But it's interesting that sites like this survive unrecorded. And I think it means when we're looking at the future, one of the big things is I think there's great potential here, not just for detailed survey at the known sites, because none have been properly fully surveyed, but also targeted field work along the coast. And really the other thing beyond, of course, huge potential for historic documentary research, so many of these sites are rarely at threat from coastal erosion. And given the fact that these peat sites are in themselves fairly unique, certainly at a, a local level, I think a real need for monitoring. Thank you.